You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. All right, folks, uh, President-elect Joe Biden has chosen a new education secretary. He is Miguel uh, Cardona. He's the commissioner of uh, Connecticut Public Schools, uh, and he is going to be the, edu the education secretary uh, under Joe Biden. Last year, the 45-year-old was named Connecticut's top schools official. If confirmed, he will have moved from an assistant superintendent to secretary of education in less than two years. Joining us right now is Dr. Steve Perry. He's the founder of Capital Preparatory School uh, uh, there in Connecticut. Also, they have a school there in Harlem as well. Uh, knows uh, this candidate quite well. Steve, we originally booked you and Margaret Fortune, president and CEO of Fortune School, she will be joining us shortly uh, to talk about uh, black charter leaders' oppositions to uh, three names are being floated, uh, but they were not chosen by Joe Biden. Uh, share with our folks uh, your thoughts on uh, this choice. Good choice, lukewarm choice, bad choice by Joe Biden to be education secretary. First of all, good evening, Roland. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, brother. You are telling our story to the world, and, and we can never, ever, ever thank you enough. So first of all, thank you for that. Second, um, Dr. Cardona is um, a relatively new commissioner here in the state of Connecticut, and I'm favorable to him, uh, not because he's been overwhelmingly supportive of school choice, or because he's been overwhelmingly uh, innovative. In neither case have we seen that. Uh, but in all fairness to him, he began his super or his commissionership uh, really in the midst of a pandemic. So we can only hold him accountable, but for so much. We, meaning the NAACP and I, had spent the past six months attempting to work with his office to create a more uh, robust opportunity for black and Latin people to become teachers in the state of Connecticut. And uh, his office has not been especially effective at executing that, which is terribly disappointing. But my hope is that when he goes to Washington, that he will pick up the mantle of this opportunity and create more uh, spaces for black and Latin people to become teachers in the United States of America. Margaret Fortune uh, with uh, Fortune Schools out of the West Coast. She joins us via phone. Margaret, your thoughts on this uh, new pick to be education secretary? Well, Roland, I think it represents the um, president-elect Biden stepping out of uh, the fire of um, picking a union leader, frankly. You know, just a few weeks ago, um, we understood that Lily Eccleson Garcia, the past president of NEA, was the, the lead candidate with the support of the Hispanic Caucus, uh, and the Hispanic Caucus shifted and uh, and now supports uh, Dr. Miguel Cardona. I think that's a good sign for school reformers across the country that, that Biden is not looking to pick that particular fight at confirmation. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, he has picked somebody who is, uh, has a track record in public education, who is not looking to spend his time picking fights with charter schools, which are public schools, um, and that I anticipate will focus on getting schools reopened safely in Biden's first 100 days. And I think, Roland, that's an agenda we can all get behind, no matter what type of school you're leading. It's also important to I want to, to bring note, in uh, uh, Candace. Uh, I want to, uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, Dr. Cardona went to a school of choice when he was in high school. He went to a vocational technical school. He did not go to his neighborhood school, which is an important distinction because I think he understands how when a child is given the opportunity to attend the school that is best for them, how it could put them on the path to live their dream. And he would appear to be living his. So he has the capacity to have the empathy towards those of us who seek the opportunity for children to choose the best school for them. I want to bring in uh, Candace and Rena, two of my panelists. I want to get their thoughts on uh, this pick by Joe Biden. Uh, Candace, I want to start with you. Jeffrey Canada was one of the folks whose name was being mentioned. Uh, that would have been a really 
huge pick, an inspirational leader, a visionary, somebody who bring the passion as well. Someone with a national profile uh, would have been interesting as well. Uh, uh, and but, but but to Margaret's point um, on that point, uh, you know, union uh, union leaders really thought that Joe Biden was going to pick. Uh, one of their own uh, to be education secretary, uh, he chose not to. Yeah, not only did he choose not to, but he's he chose someone who has been against unions in terms of opening up schools. Let's look at the numbers. Where are we now when it comes to the coronavirus? Everybody wants schools and malls and restaurants to open, but we're now looking at headlines of a virus that's mutated. So that's going to be a, a hump for him. On the other hand, uh, we've got, you know, Betsy DeVos in this very expensive helicopter view. And now you do have someone who's on the ground walking, understanding what it really means to be in the system. He's got two daughters that are in the public school system. He was the youngest principal ever in the state at the age of 28. So he knows exactly what's going on. And I think that we're going to see a lot of good things from him. Certainly you had Republicans and Democrats who were wondering, well, who is this guy? But the thing is, they didn't necessarily hate him. They didn't necessarily like him because they. I think that they understood, let's wait and see from this guy what we're going to get. It's not a bad choice. We just don't know exactly what he's going to do because of his record. It is not a, a very long record in terms of the type of national attention that people have when it comes to solving these issues. But he certainly is in the trenches. And that's what somebody wants. They want somebody who's in the trenches. And as we know, all eyes are on Biden. He selected someone who is a person of color. And he selected someone that believes in the education system and fought hard in that he's the first person to have even graduated from college. So I think he understands it. And I, I think that a lot of people have a lot of high expectations for him. And we just have to wait and see if they're going to be met. Rena Shaw? Well, I think this is an incredible pick on so many levels because he's not very controversial. I think that's the beauty of this pick in, in essence because he comes from an, a very unique background, being the product of public schools. As Candace mentioned, somebody who at 27 was the youngest principal of schools in Connecticut in the entire state. That says something. When you're a product of public schools and you've spent your career talking about how you want to strengthen those schools and you want to embrace the diversity that's out there from people who grow up in projects to half a million dollar homes, you really understand what needs to change about U.S. education. So I have full faith that Dr. Cardona is going to do that. Of course, I love the fact that he is the first Latino person to be appointed, uh, not just state education commissioner as well in Connecticut. And, and, and so this Biden pick, I fully believe, is strong because it really goes back again to Biden really wanting to be a unifier in these picks, really wanting to be... Um, somebody who who finds people that that really I believe can work in that moderate middle lane bringing people together and I think it's best evidenced by people who ran charter schools in Connecticut uh, they say that he was very fair he wasn't anti-charter he wasn't pro-charter he was incredibly fair from his post and I think that is a beautiful thing I'm somebody that really wants to see school choice enacted I'm not a Betsy DeVos type but I know the arguments that conservatives have brought against the U.S. Uh, public education that we have and against the Department of Education in general. Uh, I know a lot of conservatives generally want to defund that department. Cardona, I think, is going to bring a tone uh, in heading up that department that really unifies people behind the idea, again, of just we really need strong public education in this country because our students need to be able to compete with the superpowers that are rising in the world, like China and India. And those students out there, STEM is everything for them. I want to see that happen in our public schools here. Dr. Cardona is going to be a very good person in this role. I look forward to watching him grow. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily worried about, uh, a, frankly, a controversial pick, Steve. I think uh, big and bold is important. And I think what often happens is, and this happens a lot with president, and I go ahead and say this here. When we talk about, uh, whenever you hear uh, politicians run, you talk about the importance of veterans and the military, yet yeah, typically, frankly, presidents pick weak-ass people uh, to be the head of veteran affairs uh, in the department. When you talk <clears throat> about education, they always talk about, oh, education, I want to be the education president. It's the most important thing, mm, but it's not considered to be one of those picks. This, to me, this is one of those things where, again, you put your money where your mouth is. If you really think it's a priority, you go big or you go home. 
And I would think that I don't think Dr. Cardona would consider himself going big. I don't think Dr. Cardona would expect himself to be a person who comes in and revolutionizes education. The notion of public education is often spoken of in, in loving terms, but the public education system has failed black and Latin people since its inception. So I'm not in a hurry to protect such a system. And I think it's foolish for anyone to defend such a system, especially knowing that it is currently destroying the livelihoods of millions of black and Latin children. I want someone who understands what the data is telling us. The data is telling us when you provide children with the opportunity to choose a school that is best for them, they tend to do better in that school. Fact, just 15% of all schools in the United States of America are magnet and charter schools, yet they represent 65% of all the top performing schools in the, in the U.S. News and World Report top performing high school's uh, uh, matrix. So why then wouldn't we create more opportunities like that? The reason is because we have this bizarre affection towards the neighborhood school, knowing that every single time it's come before the United States uh, Supreme Court, what we find is that it is the epitome, the meaning the neighborhood school, the epitome of racism and classism and, and removing the opportunity that children have. So my hope is that Dr. Cardona um, looks around and recognizes that other children want what he had, which is to choose the school that was best for him and then to choose the colleges that were best for him, not to be cordoned off into the schools that were just closest to his home. That public school idea is a dead animal that we need to let lie. Roland, I Margaret. also think that this, uh, yeah, I also think that this pick of Dr. Codona signals that we may see more of the education policy, particularly in this time of the pandemic, being driven out of the White House. Um, you know, to your point, this is a, a pick who is uh, an unknown, a relative unknown out of, out, outside of, of course, the state of Connecticut, uh, and who not long ago was an assistant superintendent of a, a school district with 9,000 students. Um, you know, to, by, by way of comparison, you know, some of our largest school districts uh, in uh, in the United States have anywhere from 50,000 to 500,000 students. So this is not a pick that I see really driving policy, but maybe somebody who would be um, executing policy that is driven out of the White House. Uh, there are a lot uh, that say that Dr. Jill Biden, given her role as an educator, uh, will have an outsized influence in education policy uh, in America. Uh, we'll see what that looks like. You know, does it look like uh, Hillary Clinton uh, with health care policy? Um, if it does, we hope that she will fare better than that. Um, we, we also um, want to point out that the Biden transition team has been going uh, through great lengths to have stakeholder meetings in the area of education. Uh, I've had the, the opportunity to participate in two such meetings. This type of pick tells me that they were listening. Uh, what we'd really like to see from the charter school space is an expansion of charter schools, uh, like what we saw under President Obama, <coughs> where charter school enrollment increased by 1.7 million students. But this time around, we'd really like to see an emphasis on leaders of color, uh, black and Latino leaders who are starting charter schools um, out of an act of self-determination. Uh, it is promising uh, that we won't see uh, a fight uh, in the uh, uh, for confirmation like we would have with some of the other picks. Uh, is this a pick that is like an Arne Duncan under Obama, where you know there's a, there's a clearly formed ideology there and uh, and a, and uh, an education policy that's you know based on the work of, of icons like Jeffrey Canada with the Harlem uh, Children's Zone? No. Uh, is this uh, even a pick uh, like, um, uh, you know, under uh, under Bush, um, you know, uh, with uh, no child left behind, where there's a, a clear policy there? No, I think we are in, uh, entering into a stage of uh, of recovery, and uh, and trying to figure out how we can reopen safely. Um, I know that in California, where we have had a turn for the worse in terms of our uh, COVID-19 cases and our deaths due to COVID-19, the schools have been steadily preparing for reopening. Um, it is a curious thing without a national policy 
around reopening schools, how this is playing out at the local level. My local mall is open for business. Um, my local retail operation is open for business, but the schools uh, are not. Uh, even though we've gone through a tremendous amount of preparation and also been uh, had our plans reviewed by the county health department and meet with county health officials uh, every week. Um, there's a litany of things I can tell you that we have done to prepare uh, to be able to operate. Uh, not that I'm saying that that, that is the first priority of, of every educator in, in America, and we certainly want to do it safely. Um, but I think that there's a need for a national policy so that we can have some consistency rather than it playing out differently uh, from, from one jurisdiction to the next. Sorry, you went out, Roland. Steve, what, what do you yeah. want to see from this pick? What I would like to see from this pick is for him to think boldly, to understand that each child deserves an opportunity to expand their opportunity beyond their neighborhood. And so I would like for him to take a look at the um, race to the top and understand that that is the most powerful uh, holdover from the Obama administration. It changed the lives of literally millions of families simply by creating incentives within the the state department, I mean, uh, the uh, Department of Education, whereby people could gain access to revenue were they to create opportunities within their respective states. It's that kind of expectation that I have of him. Uh, he knows what it is that he needs to do in that space. And my hope is that he looks across the nation and recognizes the, the opportunity that he has. Um, Candace and Rena. Uh, Rena, you said you're excited to see what he does. Uh, your, uh, out of all the things he, the, this pick to focus on, what do you want him to focus on as education secretary? Well, I'm very much in line with Dr. Perry right there uh, with two very young children. My, my daughter just turned five last month, and so therefore she's not eligible to start kindergarten until next fall. I've been thinking a lot about what I will do with my now five-year-old come January. It is very frustrating for a parent like me to have to have a uh, balance a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old at home. All this year, virtual learning has not worked for either my children, them not having uh, an education uh, virtually or in person, I have seen has been a detriment. It has put the onus on me as a parent to really figure out what my child needs. And so I, again, very strong proponent of school choice here, but it has really changed my attitude about what our schools do, how they function. So I'm, I'm right there with Dr. Perry on what he wants um, from this pick. I think there is evidence uh, in, in the now Secretary of Education's past in Connecticut to show that he is somebody that, that does want school choice. I, I think, again, you just have to read between the lines. You have to look at his very short tenure uh, to see what he's done in Connecticut. It is small, but I'm, I'm encouraged that he understands diversity. That really matters. Again, when we're talking about Black and Latino students. I'm, of course, from the Asian American community. We are a very different community when we talk about education. Um, our immigrant parents come here, and it is just a totally different uh, ball game for us. So by no means am I equating what the Asian American experience is with Black and Latino students. Uh, this is something. The problem is, I think Arnie Duncan has written about it just recently. Speaking of, I know he's just wrote, uh, written an op-ed about how education is chase, changing at such a fast pace. That is incredibly difficult, difficult. And that is what this now Secretary of Education is going to have to keep up with. But one thing I see in Biden choosing him and being married to Dr. Jill Biden, who is at the community college level, actually just near my home here in Northern Virginia, um, is where she'll teach. But but uh, I think what I see here is him sort of saying Dr. Jill Biden's going to steer the ship when it comes to the higher education stuff. We know that Biden really likes sweeping reforms such as uh, finding a way to make uh, college tuition free uh, for those earning under 125,000 I believe those families he wants uh, he wants that for those college students uh, but I, I but I also see in again this pick of Card uh, dr. Cardona is is Biden saying 
let's really focus on reopening. And I, that's all I've heard, Roland, from the longest time from the right is reopen our schools, reopen our schools. And so that's why I'm sort of led to believe that this is a good approach. This is probably the best pick for the moment. Candace. Well, I think that reopening schools is one of those things that continues to be hotly debated, as I said before. With the virus mutating so much, the virus is really in charge. But on the other hand, in terms of here are some of the things I want to see Dr. Cardona do. I want to see him go in and change what we see in the school system when it comes to diversity. And I mean that in terms of teachers. I mean that in terms of what the classrooms look like. Because let's take New York City, for example. We see that the mayor has changed school choice and programs in, in, in that regard so that people can go where they want to, that they're not confined by maybe uh, some type of geographic uh, uh, destination. They're not confined by the gentrification that's taking over so many neighborhoods. Because when that happens, we still see that the classrooms are either mostly all white or mostly all black. And this doesn't make any sense because when that happens, we see the, the, the level of education change. So I think that he knows first and foremost what it means to be a minority in this country and what it means to have a school teacher that looks like you, that talks like you, and that can actually instill, you know, words of wisdom and hope for someone that is a, a brown or black child in America. And that's going to change everything. We talked before about what do these newsrooms look like, look like. It's going to change that because then we're going to start with younger people and we're going to tell them, you can be a journalist. We're going to tell them, this is what you need to do. So it all ties into each other, but di diversifying these classrooms has got to be key. It just well, has to this be is, key. Well, then this is one of the areas that Dr. Cardona has fallen short of. In fact, while almost 40% of the children who attend Connecticut's public schools are black or Latino, only 4% of the state's teachers are black. Only 4% of the state's teachers are black under a commissioner who is Latino. He was presented by the NAACP a well thought out strategy to create more opportunities that his team said would in fact increase the number of black and Latin people who currently teach within 12 months and we were not able to get it done. So this is not me talking about what I think. This is me participating in those conversations over the past six months. And so simply because a person is of color, it does not mean that they're going to necessarily move forward the agenda of people of color. It is our obligation as people of color and our allies to make sure that we hold this brother to account, to make sure that he does what is necessary to create the, the, um, the route to becoming a teacher. So specifically, one of the things that we talked about is in Connecticut, in order to become an elementary school teacher, you have to pass five practice examinations, five. Why? When we know the majority of African-American children go to schools in which they're not prepared for the state uh, for standardized assessments. And so when they become uh, college students, they don't become much more prepared. And when they graduate, they don't become more prepared either. So we need to push Dr. Cardona to put his policies where he says his heart is, which in this case, I have firsthand account that this is an area where he has not met the expectations of the community and could either before leaving the state of Connecticut and or upon arriving in Washington, D.C., make it his business. This is not a charter conversation. This is not a magnet conversation. This is not even a school choice conversation. This is a equity and equity conversation and one that is not being taken seriously throughout the rest of the country because too few people are in classrooms where the classes are taught by black people. I'll finish here. In 70 of the 149 school districts in the state of Connecticut, you can go and not ever have a black teacher. 70 in the state of Connecticut where Dr. Cardona is currently commissioner. It's unacceptable and it can be corrected. Dr. Perry, I hear you on the issues All completely. Right. And I think you bring up some good points about data. But what I read is that Dr. Cardona has been focused on equity issues in some ways. I don't think he's been entirely deficient because under his tenure, Connecticut became the first state to require high schools to offer black and Latino studies. It happened before That's he became commissioner and it happened in the legislature. It had nothing to do with him. Well, well thank you for clarifying.
I read under, it was under his tenure and that he was also oh. chairman of a state task force that examined achievement gaps in those populations. So I'm not Again, sure uh, if no, no, I, no, I appreciate I, what you're saying. Don't have an equipment. And, and I can tell you, source, I apologize. Like Senator, yeah, Senator Doug McCrory, who is the education chair uh, in the Senate and others, made it their business. These brothers and sisters made it their business to make Connecticut the first state in the nation to require uh, black studies. But let's be clear, it's going to be taught by white people. So if 4% of the teachers in the state of Connecticut are, are, are black, then who's teaching it? Steve Perry, Margaret Fortune, I thank both of you for joining us. Thank you so very much. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.